My goal for today was to break down very simply what this means in the workplace, as well as what can we do to get started today, everybody in this room, so that we can instill this in the culture. I wanted to put this together to like break it down and define what it all means so that hopefully when we leave here, we have a better understanding of what all of this stuff means. I want to ask you all a question, which is what makes the difference between a place that people genuinely love working and a place that they cannot wait to leave? I just want you to think about that right now. I want you to put an idea in your head. I know a lot of you have worked at places or maybe you couldn't wait to leave. You were watching the clock, you hated it. And a lot of you have voiced that you feel differently here. So I just want you to think about that. I'm just gonna give you like 10 seconds. Just hold the idea in your mind. So I'll tell you guys a story. My first job out of college was 24 hour fitness. And so what happened was that I graduated college and my dad knows this, uh, packed up my Prius and then drove to Costa Mesa, California. And my idea was, you know, I'm gonna just literally go figure out like all the gyms within the radius of where I got an apartment and I'm just gonna apply all of them and see where I get a job. And the reason I ended up taking 24 hour fitness instead of like one of the nicer ones like Equinox or like a bougie gym is actually just because I really need to make money. And 24 hour fitness was the first place I could make money very quickly. Uh, it didn't have as much like career pathing, growth opportunity, all those things. I just was like, I need to make sure I can afford to live here, right? And I could start right away at 24. And so, what I didn't realize was that when I got to 24 Hour Fitness, I actually ended up with one of the best leaders that I could have asked for. Uh, his name was Mike. And he had been there for, I think, four or five years at the time. And he was my direct manager. He was the manager of all the personal training at that facility. And he was, I, I honestly went into the job thinking like, there's no way I'm gonna actually like working here. Like, just because like I had ideas of what I wanted to do and it was so much greater than being a personal trainer at that gym. And Mike was actually, in hindsight, the reason that that job was so enjoyable. You know, he had very clear communication. He always did one-on-ones and took time to see like, how do I feel? What's my development like? Like, how are you uh, doing in terms of sales? Do you need help here? Like, what can we do to further promote your growth? Uh, he was predictable in that he always was at certain meetings. He always ran certain meetings every week. Uh, and I didn't ever see him blow up at anybody. So I never felt like, he was gonna like come down on me one day. And I think I was waiting in the beginning and then like it never happened. And so I was like, wow, okay, this is cool. Like that's nice because my idea of a boss was somebody who would you know, manically yell at you one day. Uh, he was encouraging in terms of like, I never remember Mike saying anything bad. Um, I remember him always constantly telling me because I was so nervous in the beginning. Like I'd never sold before and I had to sell to get my own clients. And all I remember is Mike ta constantly telling me like, you can do this, it's just a skill, you just need to learn it. It's not that you're not good at sales, you just haven't learned sales. And I didn't even realize at the time how useful of a belief that was, is that it's not that I'm bad at sales, it's that I'm inexperienced at sales, right? And he helped instill that in me. He was fair and he didn't sugarcoat it though. You know, I remember there was a time when uh, I was doing a prep for a competition and like my numbers were sliding and he pulled me into the office and he was so kind in the way that he brought it up because he basically said like, hey, I've noticed your numbers are down, like, how can I help? Rather than like, fuck you, your numbers are down, you piece of shit, which is not uncommon in the fitness industry. Um, and lastly, is he made a hard job fun. I'll, I'll never forget, it was my birthday. And they had this thing at the gym where anyone that knows me super well knows I get startled easily. And they would always, like when I was least expecting it, I could be training a client, I could be cleaning something, I could be trying to make a sale, they would come from behind and scare me. And on my birthday, he put together this compilation video of like every time someone scared me in the gym, apparently they had recorded it. And I was just like, wow, like what kind of boss does that? Like how freaking cool, you know what I mean? Got me a cake and everything. And I was like, I loved it. And I really think that because of Mike, I ended up really loving sales. And I don't think I would have otherwise because sales to me, when I first heard, I was like, Ooh, you know, like I was just like, you know, I don't want to do that. Um, but then throughout the process of working for him, I actually really learned to love it. And in hindsight, I think that I really loved working for him is actually what it was. So then they actually asked Mike to go open a new location. So they were opening a location. We were in Costa Mesa. They're opening this big, beautiful one in orange. And he was like, guys, one day he's like, I've got to go. They've asked me to go open this new location. So it's going to be great though. You know, you've got not Mike coming to take over. And I was like, Okay, and like at the time I didn't think anything of it. I was like, oh, I, you know, it's been great. I'm sure it's gonna keep being great. And then Nutmeg came in and I will never forget the first meeting. He sat us down. We were the top producing sales team, which is personal trainers that sell personal training uh, in all of the region. And he sat us down and I've never heard someone say fuck so many times in my life. He was like, you fucking young motherfuckers, listen up. Cause here, not doing any more of this shit. 
okay? We're gonna, we're gonna get our numbers up and we're all like, our numbers are up. You know, like the things he was saying made no sense. He just continued to swear at us, yell at us. It was the first meeting I was just like, holy crap, who's this guy? It was just complete polar opposite. Um, I remember he wasn't a good communicator. So if like, I reached out to him to ask him anything, he didn't respond or it took him like a day or two days to respond to something. Uh, he was very unpredictable in that sometimes he was in the office, sometimes he wasn't in the office, sometimes he was on meetings, sometimes he wasn't. We would like all show up for the sales team meeting and he would just not be there. And we were like, all right, I guess we're just not having it today. Um, uh, he was very assumptive and unfair. So I remember uh, exact words is that when I realized that uh, he was a terrible boss and I started thinking about leaving, my sales number started dropping, uh, as did like half the team. <laughs> and he came up to me and he was like, why are your numbers down? And I was like, I don't know, because I just didn't want to talk to the guy. I remember he was like, if you don't get your numbers up, I'm literally going to run you over with my truck and light you on fire. And I was like, holy shit, like exact words, this is real. And uh, he made the hard job really horrible. Uh, I remember I went from like being excited to go to work every day, feeling like I had accomplished, you know, attaining a new skill, I'd learned all these new things, and I had this great team, to like every day I sat in my car and I would cry before I went to work, which is like embarrassing to say, like a grown ass woman crying, but I was so stressed and I was so afraid to go in because it felt like the entire environment changed. It went from this place where like, we all just had this amazing team energy to this place where like everyone was like trying to hide, trying to leave early. I knew people were taking their clients and leaving and it was just like, it was awful. And so it was really that instance that led me to want to build a company where that didn't exist. Because can you guess what happened three months after he came in? We went from breaking records to being mediocre at best. So we went from being the top in the region for almost a year to basically everybody that was at the top left. So there were like three private gyms and it was literally like me and six of the other top trainers all dispersed into those three gyms. And then it tanked. Sucks. And that experience is really what created, I guess like everything that I do today. Because I remember we started gym launch you know, years later, I kept thinking to myself, like, I know what a difference it is to have an absolutely horrible boss and leader and or no leader, right? And then to have one that is, you know, truly investing in people, praising people, encouraging people, um, because I experienced it firsthand. And so I know what it's like, because I think I felt like the three words that I, I remember feeling is like confused. You know, sometimes people yell at you when you come in, sometimes they don't. So you're just like kind of constantly on edge, uh, unhappy and anxious, like constantly in a state of anxiety. And it's crazy to me to think that just the person that leads an organization or even leads a department can create that for everybody else on the team. And experiencing it in that job really just made me realize when we started acquisition.com, when we started Gym Launch, when we started Allen, when we started all of them, and each time I think I've gotten more clear on what that is, that we need to do the opposite. And I think that the reason that a lot of people don't like work is because they don't like their boss and they don't like the people at work not because they don't like work. I think that the reason that so many people nowadays say, I don't want to work, I'm like, well, we like to do things we like. And so what that tells me is you just don't like work, right? And I think a lot of reason for that is because people don't take the time to really learn how to lead people. Does anyone want to take a guess at what the difference was between Mike and not Mike? Yes. Uh, Mike praise, not Mike. There you go. So Mike used positive reinforcement to get people to do stuff, to put it simply, right? Not Mike used punishment to get people to do stuff. That was the fundamental difference between the two of them. So let me explain this and define what each of those mean. And again, if you go Google these things, I think the definitions are dog shit. So uh, I worked with Trevor and came up with our own. Um, so positive reinforcement is the introduction of a desirable or pleasant stimulus after a behavior. Okay, so the desirable stimulus reinforces the behavior, making it more likely the behavior will reoccur. Okay, so think about like giving a dog a treat. That's a positive reinforcement. Versus punishment, which is the infliction or imposition of a penalty as retribution for behavior. Meaning somebody does something and then you do something that makes them want to avoid doing that again. Which could be if the dog jumps on the couch, you smack the dog. So I use those examples, which is you give the dog a treat and then you scold the dog. And it's actually really interesting because if you look at a lot of studies on uh, training animals, the animals that have the most, uh, that adhere to behavior change the most, they use positive reinforcement with. So it's funny because actually on a lot of my content where I talk about this, dog trainers comment. They're like, hell yeah, positive reinforcement works best for dogs too. I'm like, yeah, 
We're all the same. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but here's the thing that's crazy and that I want everyone here to understand is that both work. So punishment works and positive reinforcement works. Otherwise, people wouldn't be doing it. So I'll give you some examples. Uh, one company that uh, you could say is successful is Coinbase. So uh, I'll be honest, there were like uh, so many examples of shitty companies that I could use here um, that have really terrible employee churn. Um, but it was interesting because I wanted to show you the companies, you know, a billion dollar company, 4,500 employees, uh, majority of the employee base lasts 15 months. It's awful. Uh, these are the kind of things I saw when I went through their reviews. The top three, no work-life balance, most intense place I've ever worked, never know when it's your time, meaning like it's your time to go. Um, but here's the thing, and this is why a lot of people ask, they say, well, why would organizations use this? And many of you have been in organizations that use punishment. And the reason that they can use punishment is because they have high enough demand that they can outpace the churn of the staff. So let's take a place like um, another one that has uh, not the best reviews and ratings, and I know most people have worked there, is Goldman Sachs. So very prestigious place, but it's essentially the golden handcuffs. So what do the golden handcuffs mean? It's that basically what they have to do is that they use punishment to get people to do things there, right? But in order to continue to get people to do things, they have to keep raising the bar of what is acceptable, meaning you have to do more and more not to get punished. And the reason that they can do that is because they've got a line out the door of people who want to work there. So what happens when someone leaves after two years is they've got, you know, honestly, tens of thousands of other people waiting to take that person's job. They don't give a shit. And so for them, because of the things I'm about to explain, it makes more sense for them to use punishment because they don't understand the long-term repercussions of it. Whereas there's a company like Neutrogena. It's a $4 billion company, 750 employees. So interesting is that they have a 10.2 year average tenure of employees there. Really fantastic. Top three things, if you look at when uh, under their ratings and reviews, feel appreciated for my work, flexibility and work like integration. I feel like I matter. They value praise, good benefits, fair pay, right? So just all around, if you read anything about Neutrogena and their culture, it's like, wow, that sounds like a great place to work. It sounds awesome. And so the point I'm making here is that both of these companies are large and known. They both use different ways to get people to do things. So if that's true, the question is just like, why would you use punishment at all? Like, why are these places doing that if you can use positive reinforcement and get the same outcome? It's because of the short-term cost, okay? So positive reinforcement is like a J curve in terms of it is slower to start, but then it creates lasting change for behavior. So what that means is that most workplaces don't use it because you don't see the results immediately. Punishment, if I came in and I truly yelled at somebody in here, you'd probably immediately stop doing what you were doing, right? But if I ask you, do you think that's the best use of your time? How are you feeling about that? You know, do you think that we should be doing that here? And I ask somebody to reflect, they might reflect then, then they might look back on it on a week, and then they might start to think about it. And it might take one or two more times of me asking that person that question for them to change the behavior. So that is why people don't use this in the beginning, because people say, oh, it doesn't work. Well, it works if you keep doing it, kind of like losing weight. It's like, OK, well, I ate an apple every day for a week, and I didn't lose weight. It's like, no shit. You've got to do it for like two years, right? So punishment, on the other hand, is actually faster to start off but then creates long-term dysfunction and behavior adherence only when the threat is present. Who here has worked somewhere where when the boss is gone, everybody acts differently? That point proven. Um, what it means is that, think about this. Anyone here have a dog? Okay, so easiest example that I like to use is when you train a dog and you're like, every time it goes on the couch, you just get off the couch and you like scold it. And then every time you fucking come home, this fucking dog's on the couch, right? Or you come home and you're like, there's fur everywhere on the couch. This dog's clearly been on the couch. The dog knows that you're going to punish it if it sees you on the couch. So when the threat, aka you, are present, it won't jump on the couch. But the moment you are gone, it absolutely will jump on the couch. It's like, homie's out. I I'm getting on this fucking couch, right? <laughs> and so that's the fascinating part, is that when you use punishment, you create a workplace where people will avoid punishment rather than uh, take on or adhere to the actual behavior you want. So they won't do the behavior that you don't want them to do when you are there. But that doesn't mean they're going to do the behavior you even want them to do. Does that make sense? 
avoidance versus you know, seeking to actually change. And so the TLDR, punishment means that the person is likely to adhere when the threat is present and rebound when it's not. And that's why you see this in the workplace where it's like people feel like people are doing things behind their back. It's like, well, that's probably because that person is very punishing. And so they're trying to avoid that person. They're trying to do things behind their back simply because of fear. It's not because, you know, I, I think I see it in younger leaders, uh, especially in our portfolio companies, when they say, well, like, these really, you know, they didn't do this, blah, blah, blah. And they're like complaining about something. And I'm like, because you're fucking terrifying. Of course they're doing things behind your back. Like, I wouldn't be loyal to you either. You yell at them all day. You tell them that they're stupid. Of course. Like, what? I would do it too, right? So both of these work. But the question is, because we understand both of them work, one works better in the short term, one works better in the long term, it really comes down to, uh, especially in a workplace where it's okay if it only works in the short term because you have so much demand, right? Then what's the cost besides the short term and long term repercussions? So punishment, if you were to think about all the costs that a, an organization takes on if they use punishment rather than positive reinforcement. One, it creates an environment of secrecy because people are afraid to reveal mistakes because it's like, what happens if you fuck up? They probably tell you that you suck, they're upset, they visibly make a face, whatever it is, right? Uh, the second, and this is one that I think is the worst, is that it causes significant anxiety and stress issues in the teammates. So I, again, use dogs, um, but if you look at the studies of dogs where they were used, uh, where they used punishment to train them rather than positive reinforcement, those dogs had all sorts of behavioral mental health issues. And so what it actually was is they were under perpetual stress and anxiety because they were in fear at all points in time. Really interesting. The third is that over time it creates resentment. So what happens when you feel like someone is constantly imposing upon you and you have no free will is you feel resentful of them. Uh, it removes all feelings of autonomy from workers and creates a feeling of imprisonment. Many people say, I feel like I'm in prison. Yeah, stuck, exactly. And they're not stuck, but it absolutely feels like you're stuck. They basically do the minimum amount of work not to get fired. So it's the people that are like, oh, I'm fucking out at 5 p.m. Like, I'm not checking jack shit. They pay me for this, blah, blah. That's exactly where that comes from, right? Punishment is being used. Therefore, you get no discretionary effort from anybody. And that brings to point six, which is you miss out on discretionary effort, loyalty, tenure, and innovation. So what happens when somebody's in uh, essentially like a state of stress at all points in times is that you're not able to access discretionary effort of those people. Who here has felt like they have more creativity since working at acquisition.com? That's discretionary effort. And when you're under constant stress because you're being punished, you can't access that. I mean, it's the same for me. I mean, if I'm punishing myself, it's, we can do it to ourselves too, right? Then I don't have discretionary effort to give to acquisition.com. And so uh, that's one thing that places like that miss out on. And so they do turn out people more and more also because they keep saying this person, they're just not giving it at all. They're not taking initiative. They're not the, it's like, well, have you created an environment in which it is conducive for people to take initiative, right? Because if you create the environment where it makes sense that people would because they have discretionary effort, then it makes it much easier. And lastly is that people will just work as hard as the bar is high. And so you have to continue raising the bar because the other piece about punishment is people become desensitized to it over time. They get used to it. And so that means that the boss has to punish more and raise the bar higher in order to get more out of people until it becomes a place where everyone is consistently walking on eggshells. Has anyone ever been anywhere like that? It just gets worse and worse over time, right? It's like, First they like say something a little rude, then it's like they full on yell at you, and then it's like now there's consequences, they're threatening to fire you. I remember at uh, 24 Hour Fitness uh, watching the manager tell a guy after he yelled at him on like a Tuesday, told him you gotta sell more, like I don't know what you're doing bro, like you fucking suck at this, blah, blah, blah. And I watched the guy just like slump out of there, like clearly defeated. And then he came back in, it was Thursday, and I remember he held up his employment contract to him and he said, if you don't close four more deals by tonight, this is what I'm gonna do, and just rips it up in front of his face. It's like, you've gotta get more creative with your punishment because he's desensitized since you yell at him all the time. But that's the reality is a lot of places work like that. And to be clear as well, there are forms of punishment that are also unintentional. So there are times where we can work somewhere where the person is not intending to punish us. In fact, this is probably the most dangerous kind, but it's, you know, you come to your boss, you tell them something, the face they make, right? And then they might say something different, but that was your initial reaction. There's a lot of places where that could be the case, or 
there's simply no recognition at all. So you do something, you don't get positive or negative, therefore you make assumptions. On the other side, we have positive reinforcement. Okay, so what does this do? What are the costs of positive reinforcement? Um, one, it creates an environment of security because people are encouraged to discuss mistakes. People feel like it's okay to make mistakes here and that's how we learn and we grow and it's seen as not, not a terrible thing. The second is that people feel a sense of security and excitement when coming to work. So people typically say, I just wanna work all the time. I love working, I really wanna work. And it's because they're probably rewarded for their work. They're encouraged for their work. They're not punished for it. Uh, fourth is that it empowers teammates. So oftentimes it feels like it's a culture of empowerment where it's not just that the boss is encouraging people, but people are encouraging each other. And so it's a compounding effect. Uh, five is that most people in these environments do more work than anyone expects of them. Why? Because we do more of the things we like to do. And if we have an environment that has created it and made it easy for us to like work, then we want to work more. Uh, six is that it motivates team teammates to utilize that discretionary effort at work. So you can unlock more creativity, more innovation. There's a lot more that can, um, you can get from everybody. So it's like a lot of people feel like they're the only one with ideas on a team. And what that tells me when somebody says that is that they just don't know how to get ideas out of people because they haven't created an environment where it's easy to do so. And lastly is that people work hard because they enjoy the consequences of their hard work. Again, I think this goes back to like, I, I hate hearing when people say, I hate work, I hate having a job, I hate working. And I'm like, you know, I think sometimes great things come of that, right? They start an amazing business, they innovate something, they do all this stuff, but also it's just very um, sad to hear that that's like the state of so many places of work is that it's so punishing that people actually don't like it. And therefore they use that as a generalization for all work is that, oh, no, I don't, I don't like bosses. I don't like having a job, right? And you can see it when people come in here. Some of you I've talked to about it in terms of even if you've had a boss before that has been punishing to you, you might come in and you might have your first talk with me and I can tell you're nervous. And it's like, I've been nothing, like I'm not a punishing person. Like I'm, if anything, I'm like the opposite. And it's like, but I can feel the fear and it takes like, how many times does it take of me not yelling at somebody for them to realize I'm not gonna yell at them, right? It's like, I have to outdo whatever their last boss did because their last boss might've met with them five times, nothing, 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 yell and scream, right? And so it's like, until I, nothing, 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 past the yelling and the screaming, they're not gonna believe it. And so that's the cost of each of these methods, you could say, which is we do more of the stuff we like and we do less of the stuff that we don't like, work included. Right? I said this in a talk when I was talking to, uh, I think it was Jim Con, and they were like, why? why can't I get people to work more? I'm like, geez, because they don't fucking like working for you <laughs> because the environment sucks. If people liked working for you, they would do more of it. And it's always one of those like, you gotta be respected, not liked. And I think like that is really misunderstood. I think that you want to be respected and liked, not respected instead of liked. Um, because people can respect somebody, but not like them and therefore avoid the discretionary effort they will still feel all the same different ways. So this is what most people do, right? It's like you go away from the things you don't want and towards the things you do want and work included. And so I say this all because I want everyone here to understand this is how I think through uh, how we get things done here at acquisition.com. And if you feel like you ever go through a time, which you freaking will because nobody's perfect, where you're like, I don't like what I'm doing. I don't want to work today. Use these frameworks to figure it out. Talk to me, talk to a leader on the team. That's what's so beautiful about this is that it's, if we can break it down to, okay, what have I been punished for recently? Did I, was I accidentally punished? Was I not encouraged to do something? Or did I do something and not get recognition for it? And now I realize I don't feel like doing it? You can think through these things on your own. And it's funny because a lot of people, I understand why they have to quit jobs because the bosses are not on the same page about all of these things. They use negative reinforcement but that's not what we do here. And so if you ever feel that way, it's a discussion. It's like, all right, let's figure out what it was. Did you bring up something on a meeting and then everyone kind of just like sat there, but it's like, maybe they were nervous to speak up, right? Like there's all sorts of things that can occur. But I think the beauty of this is that we can engineer our own environments to make it easier for us to like our work, especially if we use our voice and speak up and raise issues before they get too big. If we realize that, hey, maybe the work itself is kind of punishing. Maybe I don't see the impact of it quick enough. Right? Because there's also that, which is some of you have very rewarding work in terms of you don't even need as much outside recognition because there's some sort of recognition you can get immediately. An easy one would be to say posting content. If you post content on maybe it's TikTok or Instagram, it's like such a quick feedback cycle. You can see so quickly 
if it works or doesn't work. And so you get reinforcement from that. You don't even need it from a person. You get it from that versus something who's even just working on a YouTube video. That might take you a month to do or five weeks to do. And some people might not like doing the YouTube because not because they don't like making YouTube videos, but because it takes so long to see the feedback cycle. And so you're getting no reinforcement in the interim, right? And so it might feel like, for, uh, for example, like when somebody is a salesperson and then they want to move up to being a sales manager, I'm like, oh shit, the feedback cycle is going to be really long. And that's why most sales guys don't make it into sales manager. I don't think it's because they don't have the skill. You can teach these skills. These are not like you're not born a manager or a leader. You're just taught. But you've been so reinforced so quickly on a daily basis, if you made a sale or didn't make a sale, that then you have to go and see, did I hit quota for the quarter? And it's like all of a sudden, all this reinforcement you were getting all the time is just gone. And so most people don't make it because they're not aware of that. And so they don't realize, oh, I'm going to need a substitution for my reinforcement. Right? Each time we seek out a new kind of work where maybe we have to delay the reward, which is delayed gratification, the way that we can get ourselves to stick with it would be substituting it with different reinforcement instead. So it's like if Alex or I know that we have like a really big goal we've got to tackle, or it's a personal goal, and we're not going to recognize it for a while. For me, might, maybe it was like recently I wanted to lose weight. For him, it's like he wants to get back in the gym. OK, you're not going to see the result of that immediately. right? But what if we encourage each other for it? And we say, like, amazing, good job every time one of us goes to the gym or eats less food, which we do. And guess what? It makes it so much easier to do because it's, it's uh, more frequent reinforcement to get us to adhere to the behavior. Really, if we're forced to do the stuff that we like, uh, forced to do the stuff we don't like, then we're going to do the minimum to get by or the minimum to avoid punishment. That's just what it comes down to. So the question is, how do we do any of this, right? Like, what is the one thing that we could do as an organization to actually instill this and help each other with it, help instill the culture so that we can also distill it down to our portfolio companies? And if there's one concept that you guys all walk away with today, um, then I would let it be this one, which is that latency matters more than intensity. Okay, I'm gonna define these and give you some definitions, uh, examples. So latency is the time between events. Okay, so low latency means there's less time between events, whereas high latency means there's more time between events. Intensity is just the power of an event. So the timing, this is what this means, the timing of your response to a behavior matters more than the power of the response. So something that I probably never said, but like I think like for, for the most part, having uh, recognition that only comes on a yearly or every few year basis, it's very ineffective because there's only a few, it takes somebody who's been already had the practice of delaying reward for years at a time to recognize that that is even possible. So for the most part, what it means is that, uh, for example, if the, the YouTube videos, right? So the timing of your response to behavior matters more than the power then if the whole time that Nadia is making a YouTube video, every time she makes an edit or a cut, she gets like, amazing, this is so awesome, good job, like this is great, throughout the whole process. That is more powerful than when the video goes off, people are like, amazing, I'm gonna shout you out on the meeting. Those 10 little encouragements along the way are actually more effective in your behavior and how you would adhere to making a video than the one at the very end. Really interesting. So what does that mean is that we do things we have learned to do, right? And we learn by experiencing things that happen. I follow me, it sounds so simple, okay? <laughs> Therefore, the things that happen closest with low latency to the behavior or event matter the most. The things that happen closest to an event or behavior of the past determine how we behave now. The way that you all behave when you come into acquisition.com is dependent on what you did in your last company not dependent on acquisition.com's culture. You can like it, you can want to adhere to it, you can want to live by this, but you have been trained otherwise, as have I. I was trained to run gym launch, not acquisition.com. It's a behavior change. And so I wanna give you guys some examples of how this affects us in the workplace and how we can take behaviors from past jobs, right, and past experiences and bring them in now. And this is how I see when I see a behavior in our company that isn't aligned with our values, because guess what? We're not perfect. We're not always going to adhere to the values 
right? Because we've been trained otherwise. And so we have to, it takes time to untrain and get enough reinforcement on the new behavior to extinguish the old one. So an example, somebody is afraid to tell a boss they messed up. It would not surprise me if somebody comes in here and they're new and they mess up and they're afraid to tell me. Why? Because in the past, their boss probably yelled at them when they messed up. I didn't yell at them, but their last boss did. They messed up and the next thing that happened was a boss yelled at them, right? Maybe the boss even apologized after. Doesn't fucking matter. They yelled at them immediately. The second, this one's very common. People are afraid to speak up on meetings. What does that tell me? In the past, they've been punished for speaking up. What does punish mean? Does that mean that like I yell at them and say like, fuck you for talking? Like, no. What it means is that they probably spoke up and people told them why they were wrong. So I can see on a meeting when somebody speaks up and they say something and it sounds like they're adding feedback and it might not be what others want to hear. And then when other people go in and basically tell them why they're wrong, I'm like, you don't know what you're doing. And it's not just me that has to do this. It's everyone, every one of us has to recognize this is that if we don't accept people's ideas and say, thank you for voicing that, then what does that mean that person is going to do? I've seen this on meetings before. They will not tell you when they know something that could potentially be a threat to the business because they've been taught that people will just come at them. Has anyone here ever experienced that? It's like you raise an issue, you think it's important, and then people, because they want to think optimistically, tell you why you're wrong. And then that person never wants to speak up again. It makes sense to me. People that are nervous to voice their opinion. The reason is because, similar to that, their opinion's been shot down in the past. Many times people are told their opinion doesn't matter, or it's like people won't even thank them for their opinion. They'll just say, like, they'll pretty much ignore it, right? And that happens in a lot of organizations. I think even getting people to fill out surveys, you know, I feel like I have to really emphasize here, and you guys are great with it, but I'm like, no, really, like, it really matters what you say. Like, I actually read them all. They're very useful, right? Because I'm aware that most people fill out these surveys and jack shit ever happens. They never hear anything and nobody ever references that they've ever read them. Afraid to take time off. You know, something that always happens <laughs> is that people come in here and it's like, it's always like a, and then I just want to tell you that I'm taking a week in December and um, <laughs> here you go. And I'm like, why are you afraid to tell me that you're taking time off? And I'm like, oh gosh, because they've been punished in the past. Their past boss probably complained immediately when they told them or was like, seriously, we're really going to take that much time off? Said some kind of side comment, right? It's not like someone doesn't have to blatantly yell in your face. They can just make a passing comment and it's like, shit, I'm not doing that again, right? So these are all things that we experience in the workplace. And these are just a couple ones that I've seen and I feel like are common that I believe come from whatever reinforcement was the response to a behavior in the past. And so that is why the timing of our responses here makes such a difference. Because think about it like this. Okay, so if the last time that you had a job and you went to go take time off, somebody like made a passing comment, whatever, then the next time that you tell me that you want to take time off, I should say, I'm so glad that you're taking time off and taking time for yourself. That sounds so fun. Where are you going? And then they're like, oh, and then I need to do that every time they do for like three or four times. So then they don't think about that past time or all the times they had with their boss before. And what could happen is that a lot of people will think, uh, even when they're trying to change behavior, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to like give them a big shout out on the team meeting, which by the way, is amazing and such a good thing. The, what I think we do a great job of is we're always very specific on our meetings, which is important because the further away the reinforcement is from the event, the more specific we need to be about what we are reinforcing because it's obvious, like if a kid w takes its first step and we clap and we smile, it's because it took its first step. But if the kid takes its first step, it gets nothing. And then a week later, you're like, you did such a great job. It's like, wait, for what? And you have to tell them exactly what it is. Taking those concepts, what can we do here to help build that culture of positive reinforcement? That's really what I wanted everyone to be able to walk away with. And the reason I wanted to relay this information is because it's not something one person can do alone. Like it's not like me understanding this and Alex understanding this and like some of us talking about it is going to be what makes acquisition.com what it is. We all have to understand it and practice it and help each other practice it and be aware of our behaviors and how they're affecting everybody else. And so what I would ask is that when you spot a behavior that is helpful, conducive to someone's goals, conducive to the company goals, right? Where there's a lot of those. Uh, it could be a teammate speaking up on a meeting, even though they're terrified, which many of you have voiced that you have been, right? It could be a teammate that's owning a mistake because guess what? We can't fix things we don't know about. It could be a leader who speaks up for their team. 
because sometimes people forget to recognize leaders. It could be someone who just helps another teammate who has no incentive to do so. Or it could be a display of values. Any of these things, right? And any other thing along the way, just someone doing their job and doing it well, being on time. I mean, think about the things that there are. There's so many things that we can praise people for. Immediately reinforce the behavior. That is what is gonna build this culture. Like the, the number one thing we can do is like, the moment that you see something, uh, and that's why I, I think that companies uh, use like, uh, what is it called, like spotted. Uh, that was like a, a program that I've seen before. And I think that's a great word for it, which is like you spot the behavior and you immediately recognize it, right? What does it look like? The easiest thing is to slap them a direct message and tell them, great job for doing whatever the thing was, right? Being on time. Great job for speaking up even though you were nervous. Great job for owning that mistake even though it's hard to do so. Great job for exhibiting competitive greatness uh, when you were having a hard week whatever it may be. You can give them kudos in the full team Slack. So some people, uh, and it's actually, this is kind of funny, but uh, some people really love getting public recognition. I would argue that people that don't love getting public recognition have been negatively reinforced in the past for getting it. So you could also just rewrite a new story if you don't like it. Uh, and when I say that, you're like, how could somebody also, because this is one that people have asked me about, why would they be negatively reinforced? Because they might say like you're an ass kisser or something like that. <laughs> like, <laughs> we're not gonna do that here, that's for sure. Uh, Third, smile on a Zoom call. So when I see one of you that is speaking up when I know you're really nervous on a call, I don't know if you noticed, but I'll be smiling <laughs> because I want you to know that when you look for me on the Zoom, I'm smiling, meaning I like it. But I think a lot of you, what you might not notice is that if you look on a call disinterested or even right now, I'll, I'll, right now, I could perceive you even if you're not trying. If you're not smiling right now, I don't know what the fuck you're thinking. I, and I'm probably gonna guess because of things in the past, like maybe you don't like what I'm saying, right? There you go, the nod, that's why the nod's important. It's like, yes, we can, let's all nod. Yeah, it's great on a Zoom call. It's like, yeah, we get you, good work. You could give them a high five. There's been a ton of studies on actually, even just giving someone a high five after they do something great is more powerful than any recognition alone because they get to interpret it. They know it's good and it's powerful, but they get to interpret it however they want. And so they usually make it mean something really great to them. And then lastly is, you know, shouting them on the weekly meeting. Again, I think this is fantastic that we do this. I just would love to do these things as well. So what did we cover? There's positive reinforcement and punishment, and both compel people to do things at work. There's a cost to each. Punishment works better in the short term, and positive reinforcement looks, works better in the long term. And timing matters the most for reinforcing behavior. What do you do immediately after you do one thing? And also I think this is cool because we can ask ourselves what do we do immediately after we do something when nobody's watching? Because we are either reinforcing positively or punishing ourselves. It's kind of like uh, when people develop behavioral issues like a uh, woman eats a piece of cake and then like makes herself run for three hours. Like what are you teaching yourself? You're punishing yourself for eating cake, right? Anyways, interesting. Did that make sense for everybody? Yes. Cool. Sorry.